So, yeah. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about something I guess like uh, a lot of people do in their respective organizations, which is handling observability, right? But uh, today I'm going to be talking about a very specific uh, use case or specific thing that I sort of helped uh, build for uh, Signals.io, one of my clients, uh, uh, with uh, the use of the new fangle tool sort of it's a new entrant to the observability block uh, since the last year around 2019 which is open telemetry um, also good to note that like uh, uh, signals.io recently got selected for yc winter batch and uh, some of my work i hope most of it will uh, make through uh, there cool so uh, just uh, uh, before i get into the uh, construction of uh, this uh, observability pipeline uh, let me describe what uh, I understand personally by observability. This is my mind map of understanding how uh, you know how we consume uh, observable services uh, in a cloud native environment. Of course, we all know about the three pillars, which is logs, metrics, and traces. But uh, the way I visualize is that they are also interrelated. Whenever a particular event happens in any application, uh, we do not consume uh, events from only a single source of this uh, three pillars, right? We need information from all of them. And these sort of intertwine uh, in uh, various ways uh, for folks like us, DevOps engineers or infrastructure engineers to make sense of what's going on inside the system. And that is the point of the term observability, right? That a system which is sort of black box is exposing data and with that data, with those sensors, we can make sense of what's going on inside the system. What's the state of the system from the external metrics, right? So we have like logs, metrics, and traces. Uh, but our objective is to get to the point where we can start doing RCAs and uh, we can start doing SLI and SLO violations. We can do anomaly detection, right? And what we see in our daily work is that having these different event sources isolated in uh, different dashboards or uh, you know different sort of uh, data visualizations uh, doesn't really work right you know well, what we usually do is we have two three different screens open we have multi screen monitor setups right and uh, in one place we are visualizing logs in kibana we are using grafana to visualize let's say parameters metrics and we have let's say a jaeger dashboard or something to uh, visualize the trace events, right? And the actual correlation of all these events to understand what is going on with the system uh, during, let's say, a downtime uh, uh, or a particular outage that's going on happens in our mind because most of these tools till now uh, have been dealing with these three set pillars in a very, very isolated manner. There are explicit tools that handle only one of these verticals. And so we have to mentally map all this data and then make any sense of it. Uh, sort of, this is where, uh, you know, uh, open telemetry steps in. Uh, so this is sort of a slide I sometimes keep uh, for, you know, an audience, uh, if you are not familiar with distributed tracing, but I think today uh, I spoke to Ashish about this, I might skip that because I believe most of you folks are familiar with distributed tracing and what it is and how it works. So I'm going to skip over this. Cool. So the reason uh, why we choose open telemetry as our core pillar of this product that we were building is uh, the first point, the three pillars of observability was under one single roof for almost the first time, right? Uh, before this, every project started, uh, tried dealing with individual pillars. And what open telemetry also brought to the table was a vendor neutral data format. So as you can see on the uh, right hand side of the slide, uh, the current state of vendors uh, and you know sort of fragmentation or you know diversity of vendors uh, in the monitoring landscape, right? And uh, what has happened with uh, each of these uh, vendors and their you know uh, sort of earlier interoperable, non-interoperable data formats was that once you set up one thing, you're sort of logged into that. And you couldn't really plug and play the different formats. Uh, you know, you couldn't interplay with the data. You couldn't, let's say, uh, take Neuralink data and uh, use that to push into Jaeger, right? You can't. You couldn't convert that, right? So this is where again, Open Telemetry sort of steps in. And you know, many of you might be knowing this is that they created this uh, interoperable data format called OTLP, 
And each of these vendors, very interestingly, sort of stepped up and created data uh, format converters to OTLP so that all of this data becomes interoperable, right? And that created a huge opportunity. And suddenly you can basically take Zipkin data and convert it to Jaeger, right? You could take uh, uh, Prometheus metrics and convert it to a different uh, type of metrics, let's say like StatsD, which uh, created a lot of in in independence in how we, in our daily practices, like, you know, how we handle observability data. Suddenly we didn't have to build things in a very, very opinionated way. We could run something on the cluster, but visualize in an entirely different data format. Right. We were not, uh, I guess, like uh, captive of one single particular product. Uh, so this is one of the reasons why we chose to, you know, go with Open to Limit. And Open to Limit is not a very old project. It started somewhere in 2019. Uh, we'll come to that. Uh, the other part that we found very interesting was uh, there's a particular component within Open Telemetry which lets not only uh, do data format conversions from one vendor type to another vendor type or vendor to open data uh, formats. Uh, it let us process uh, that custom data with very minimal Golang code. Like I could consume uh, certain data, add to it, enrich it, and then pass it on uh, in the OTLP format. And automatically the exporters would basically interpret it in the target format. And we'll see how sort of open telemetry does this, right? But this is one of the key things that uh, made us uh, choose open telemetry over, you know, using other open formats. So yeah, we'll come to the lineage of open telemetry. And this is sort of a personal thing. Every time I work with a new ecosystem or I start studying about something that's new, I try go try and go back uh, on at what point of time the IEEE standards were written and you know how, how this whole thing started because every single piece of tech that we use daily is not really novel. They all have a sort of a long lineage of you know history that sort of stays hidden because not everyone you know uh, you know digs through that, but they do have almost like decade spanning history before it comes uh, you know in front of us and it's suddenly a new thing. A same goes for open telemetry, right? So it sort of started, if you see this particular chart that's on our screen right now, it sort of started way back in 2002, three, seven, like almost like, you know, uh, two decades back, right? So uh, everybody talks about the Google Dapper paper as the source, but what people don't talk about is Google Dapper paper was itself an assimilation of three prior, prior papers, right? One was the IEEE pinpoint, uh, the 2003's MacPy paper and the 2007's X-rays paper. While I cannot claim to have read all these papers uh, completely, but I have glanced through them and I've compared them to the Google DAPA paper. Google does borrow a lot of concepts, uh, you know, and reconciles a lot of competing concepts uh, in between these three papers to arrive at what we have come to know as the, you know, the Google DAPA paper, which sort of is central to the observability ecosystem, you know, going ahead. So what happens is Google makes uh, in 2010 the Dapper paper. It uh, releases this uh, to the public, and as usual with any Google paper like HDFS or any other uh, white papers that were released, another company sort of picks it up and uh, tries to implement the paper. And in our case, this is Twitter. So Twitter implements the Dapper paper into something called a Zipkin internally. And at this time, Twitter was using the Finagle system, uh, you know, in their infra. And they sort of used Finagle, uh, took Cassandra as the backend storage and uh, created this uh, implementation of DAPA paper called Zipkin. And on 2012, they released this particular implementation to the public as an open source project and called it Open Zipkin. Uh, sometimes down the line, uh, Uber also sort of starts doing the same thing, right? Uh, they already had an internal tracing sort of a system called the Mercy Cakes. A bunch of you might be knowing about this. Uh, but they sort of adopt open Zipkin's principle, even at the initial stages, they were even using the Zipkin UI and certain components. So they sort of uh, marry the concepts they had internally with open Zipkin and create this thing called uh, Jaeger, which is probably the most popular tracing solution uh, that we have seen in the recent times. Then uh, way down the line, uh, on 2016, uh, this is the first uh, year, I think, or the first two years when CNCF was just like, you know, coming up a post Kubernetes era, right? Uh, this is when uh, Open Zipkin and Giga sort of gets merged into this thing called open tracing. And this is being led by the people 
uh, who were leading this particular project. We had Ben Sigelman from uh, Google DAPA paper. We had, I guess, Adrian Cole, who was at the point uh, leading Zipkin development. And we had Yuris Kuro from Yeager, right? And uh, these three core maintainers of these three very different projects decide that we need an interoperable central format uh, on how to do traces. And they create this thing called open tracing and donate it to CNCF. It's one of the probably earliest projects to get uh, donated to CNCF, right? Parallel to this, uh, Google, after releasing the paper, paper, they were also working on another internal uh, product for observability called Census. And they uh, released this to the public in 2018 and call it Open Census. And uh, for quite some time, open tracing and open census remain sort of competing open standards, right? Uh, Till 2019, when basically Ben Siegelman again steps up and uh, he says that, hey, uh, both of these projects have very, very common uh, goals in, in their minds. Uh, we are doing a lot of things similarly. Why don't we sort of merge this into something that's uh, going to benefit the community? And uh, unlike in other segments where everything was, everyone was doing forking off and doing their own implementations, we saw a merger of uh, two very, very popular projects into something called as open telemetry and as late as I think 2019, December, November, uh, don't quote me on that, but uh, late 2019, right? And it also borrows from the 2018 W3C uh, uh, standard headers for tracing, which is the trace context and correlation context headers. And it borrows certain concepts from the W3C paper uh, uses open tracing and open census as core uh, ideas and creates a new project called open telemetry. So as it currently stands, this is the CNCF, uh, you know, dev stats. And uh, if you can, if you folks uh, see here, and I guess our organizer here is one of the contributors to open telemetry. Uh, we have uh, some of the biggest names in the industry uh, and not only the industry, but in the observability ecosystem, right? Like New Relic, uh, uh, Datadog, a uh, bunch of companies who are working together to make this uh, interoperable data pipeline and format, uh, which also contributed to why we wanted to sort of, you know, step up and use this to build a good product. Cool. So we'll sort of, again, uh, slightly go into the architecture of this and uh, certain folks here might be familiar with this, uh, but I'll still I'll try and, you know, explain my best. So the way open telemetry is structured is uh, through three core items, basically, which is receiver, processor, and exporter. A receiver is a basically a component which receives in either proprietary or uh, uh, or in a certain data format, like even in an open data format, right? So if you have Jaeger, there is a Jaeger receiver. If you have Zipkin data, there is a Zipkin receiver. And it also has uh, the open format called OTLP, and they have created, uh, the project has uh, SDKs in most of the popular languages out there to basically integrate the OTLP SDK and create traces and metrics using that particular uh, SDK, right? So you instrument your code and the traces and metrics are flowing. Um, and for Ruby and Java, as the picture states, uh, they have auto instrumentation libraries, but for the others, uh, the instrumentation has to be done by the developer. And so we have basically one one uh, receiver each for each of these different languages and uh, different data formats. All of this, what this receiver does is receives data in this proprietary or different open data formats and convert all of them to this internal data format called OTLP and sends these to a processor. And the processor is basically sort of an in-memory queuing mechanism. There is batching where you can say that, okay, batch up this many events and then send to something else. Or you can uh, do a queued retry where it will send, but wait for an acknowledgement. And if it is, doesn't receive an acknowledgement, it will requeue it back and then send it again later on, right? So this is sort of the state manager of uh, this whole pipeline, right? It holds the events for a certain time and processes based on certain queuing logic or batching logic. But in addition to that, this processor also allows you to write custom uh, processing logic. Uh, this could be proprietary, this could be open, where you could basically process the, uh, the data that OTLP has, the receivers has, uh, have provided to you and enrich it in certain ways. So one of our ideas was that, hey, uh, we have uh, trace data. Why don't we start deriving certain inherent metrics from the uh, trace data itself? Like, why don't we uh, derive latency and uh, you know 
uh, request uh, per second, uh, QPS metrics directly from the traces itself, right? So we could do that with the processor implementation. And finally, once this data processing and queuing is done, it's all sent to this exporter component. And again, exporter implementation is very specific to the target, right? Where we are exporting the data to. So you could basically write, uh, instrument your code using OTLP or using Jaeger. But if you plug this whole pipeline into, let's say, uh, Open Census exporter, your final output format is going to be Open Census. And this is true for even vendor for formats, right? Because there is a contrib repo where the vendors are actually uh, creating these receivers and exporters per vendor to allow for you know data conversion between different formats, right? Cool. So this is again uh, sort of a bit brief overview of the internal component layout and uh, sort of the repo layout also I would say. So if you can see the green components are the are sort of on the core repo and uh, open telemetry is a separate contrib repo where the vendors contribute to either receiving uh, their format, uh, they either write receivers or exporters to their particular proprietary formats, right? So most of the vendor stuff, uh, if you can see, is in the contrib repo, uh, but most of the open source stuff implementations are in the core repo, right? So we have standard receivers like open sensors, Jaeger, Zipkin, OTLP. We have uh, TRESS receivers, proprietary ones like SignalFX, for metrics, we have standard again OTLP, host metrics, Prometheus, of course, the one of the core pillars of our observability uh, and metrics community. And then we have, you know, uh, proprietary sort of implementations for Redis, Carbon. There is a open Kubernetes uh, metrics implementation also, which is not reliant on Prometheus, but it directly uh, grabs metrics from the Kubernetes cluster using the API server queries or uh, API server APIs. Right. And then we have different processors here. We have attribute processor where you can add or subtract attributes from the trace data or the event data that you have received. You can, as I talked about batch, you can filter data out, you can uh, do queued retry, you can do sampling. We'll have a brief uh, you know, segment about doing sampling, uh, whether it's uh, tail sampling or head sampling uh, or you know, the, the various types of that, right? Tail sampling is hard by the way, head sampling comes, uh, sorry, is fairly easy to do, but uh, while open telemetry does provide uh, implementations of tail sampling, it's still sort of limited. So yeah, so these are basically some of the processors. Don't have enough time to talk about each of them in detail, but uh, some of them are fairly interesting, right? Like sampling is probably one of the most important processors and attribute processor also filtered to, right? So again, as you see on the exporter layer, uh, we have uh, exporters for each of the different formats. We have the standard OTLP, we have Jaeger Zipkin, which both are open formats. And then we have a bunch of, you know, proprietary implementation exporters for uh, proprietary data syncs. So what if you want to consume in uh, Jaeger, you want to instrument your code in Jaeger, but you want to send it to AWS X3, right? So that pipeline can be created through this particular structure, right? If you have your receiver as, let's say Jaeger, but your exporter as AWS X-Ray, you can visualize your Giga traces in AWS X-Ray. So this is what the different uh, exporters enable you to do. Same goes for metrics, OTLP, Prometheus, and then Carbon, SignalFX, Stackdriver, et cetera. Cool. So uh, one important point to note here is that the binaries for the contrib repo and uh, the core repo are not the same. So if you want to use the features or the exporters and receivers marked here in red, you'll have to use the Docker image or the compiled code uh, from the contrib repo, which is a sort of a superset of the core repo. So it has got the core components plus the extra components from the vendors. But if you uh, end up using the core uh, repos Docker image in your deployment, uh, you will miss out on uh, the components that are marked in red. You don't get any of the contrib components there. Uh, this was a bit of a tricky thing for even me when I started uh, building this thing because I was expecting more of a plugin system. But uh, uh, finally, we saw that it had to be recompiled or different uh, Docker images need to be used if you want to use different features. Cool. So uh, now we come to our first, you know, product object brief uh, target. How do we consume the client's data? Thankfully, uh, open telemetry to the rescue, right? So. Uh, to basically build our internal demo, and at this point we do not did not have clients. We're just uh, you know creating our product from scratch. Uh, we needed to do uh, emulation of client data, 
and various formats of client data. We wanted to have the data interoperability and variety as one of our core strengths. So we created a load generator application with various existing sort of load generators. Uh, we had open census trace and metrics using a simple Golang app, uh, one file Golang app basically, which is there. And then we had sort of omniscient synthetic load generator for both Jaeger and Zipkin traces. And we used fresh tracks, uh, Prometheus metrics called Avalanche. Uh, basically it's, it generates uh, fake Prometheus metrics, which sort of emulates an application. But we sort of combined all of this into a single deployment and says, hey, this is our load generator. We can toggle certain, you know, control certain tiles to basically either up the scale or down the scale and test our entire implementation out. So uh, this is our load generator. And then we had to deploy the open telemetry agent on the client side. Now, how we did it is that we had two separate clusters uh, sort of deployed. One was emulating as a client cluster and we had our, you know, the platform cluster separately, right? So we deployed the OTL agent with uh, receivers mapping to our uh, sort of emitters, the event emitters that we had configured. So we had open sensors, Jaeger and Zipkin receiver, and then we had Prometheus receiver, which uh, sort of works in a different way. So all the trust receivers, are, uh, they directly receive data from the actual instrumented code, but Prometheus scripts data. So it's sort of how normal Prometheus works. You provide the Prometheus receiver, the script config and a service endpoint, and it will go and script that endpoint and get the data out, right? And then we fan in this data to the batch and queued retry processor. And finally to, uh, initially we were not using the OTLP receiver exporter. We were using open census. Uh, so this image has that but uh, eventually we moved to the OTLP exporter. So we fanned this into the OTLP exporter. And that is where our client side implementation uh, sort of ends. And this was so awesome, right? Because we did not have to write us even a single line of code, but suddenly we were uh, able to consume at least four to five different types of data formats uh, for, uh, representing different clients that we might have in future using a simple open source component deployment, right? And uh, we consume this on a platform cluster using the collector headless service. And this is where the fan out sort of started, right? So uh, we had an OTLP open census initially, but later on we moved to OTLP. Uh, we had the receiver, which again uh, uh, routed through the batch and queued retry processors. And finally to three different exporters. So we consumed from around four formats and we were experimenting also, you know, seeing whether we can fan that out and uh, is, is the data being received correctly in all the different formats, right? And this experiment turned out to be true. So we, when we found out our Jaeger exporter had data, not only from, you know, uh, Jaeger, but it also got the generated data from both Jaeger, Zipkin and open census. We had the combined data from all three different sources in as single Jaeger format. And so went uh, Zipkin, uh, we also saw that. Prometheus sort of stayed linear because we are scraping with Prometheus and also exporting to Prometheus. So we got the data we were expecting. So this is our stage one, the first, you know, how we started building our prototype. And this sort of shows you the YAML view of the pipeline. The previous one was the architecture view. If you see, this is how we write it. Like we see that, hey, these are the receiver uh, map of receivers. We have open sensors, Zipkin. Uh, these are the endpoints for open sensors and Jaeger. I don't mention it goes to the default endpoints. And for Prometheus, I provide a script config. Uh, we give it the job name. Okay, go scrape load generator on port 9001, scrape out the metrics, right? And all of this goes to the processor definition and finally to the exporter definition, right? And finally, we organize this into the pipeline schema where we say, okay, uh, you know, these are my uh, trace pipelines and these are my metrics pipelines, right? So trace pipeline goes in a way that, okay, receivers are open sensors, Jaeger and Zipkin, processors are batch and queued retry, and finally my exporters are, let's say, open sensors and login. Metrics also receivers are open sensors and Prometheus, exporters are logging and open sensors. The reason I have the logging exporters in both cases is that we were in debug mode. And of course I needed to ensure that everything that was being received was also being finally consumed in the final data sinks, right? And, uh, but it's probably ideal not to have the logging uh, uh, exporter enabled in any of the production deployment. It's only good for uh, debug because then you are basically dumping uh, clients data, which could be sensitive, you wouldn't know, uh, into the SD out, right? So that's sort of not recommended, but we are just building a product, we are building our MVP, right? 
So yeah, uh, now we come to the one of the most important processes, which was tail sampling, right? Which we talked about previously, and this is how you do tail sampling uh, using one of the given processes, is that you define a policy. You see that uh, okay. If uh, a particular attribute type with a certain key and within a certain value range, uh, uh, if you if you match that, then do not sample. Or if you, if it matches that, then do sample. So basically, if you see from there, uh, this particular config, what it says is that if the HTTP status code is 200, then sample it because we do not want to have a lot of 200 OK data in our traces, right? Because we are not worried about success cases. We are more worried about failure cases, right? So uh, this is where the first map sort of goes, is that uh, if the status codes uh, mean value and max value, like if, if it's exit zero, then sort of sample, right? Like if, if it's not an error, then do sample. So this can also be inverted and we can explicitly say that, hey, if the error matches or if the status code matches, let's say 5xx or 3xx or 4xx, right? Certain HTTP status code, we uh, want to send those data, uh, send each of those traces individually, right? So that configuration can be uh, written down under the policies. And the one thing about, uh, you know, tail sampling is that it does not work in clustered mode of open telemetry, given that uh, tail sampling happens in memory after you have received a significant chunk of traces inside your uh, particular deployment, right? So to basically do tail sampling across, let's say, in different replicas of a single open telemetry deployment, all those uh, traces, all those uh, particular events have to be shared across. That means we need sort of a consensus mechanism. Uh, a friend in the Grafana labs actually had uh, built one of these forks and it's still sort of under in development and uh, Grafana Labs also published uh, a, a sort of blog post uh, way back when I was building this, uh, that, okay, this is how we are doing tail sampling with consensus on top of open telemetry, but it sort of had fogged off uh, pretty much from the core branch and the merge back was not uh, at that point of time allowed. And I think I should connect back, uh, you know, uh, with my friend at Grafana to discuss like, you know, sometime how, what they're planning. I'm pretty sure they are still uh, working on it, even though it was paused for a bit, right? So uh, this is how you define, uh, you know, how to sample uh, particular traces, right? So now we have solved one part of the problem. The client had the data client had various formats of data we have converted into our desirable data formats, right? So now one part of the problem is solved that we are not worried about how the client is instrumenting their code. They could instrument in any particular thing. Our solution is to deploy, uh, give them a simple YAML, which they can deploy to their cluster with the correct receiver format configured, and we will receive the data as we intend to, and then we can manipulate it around. But now we come to the second pro problem, which is now we are, let's say, targeting multiple clients. That means multi-tenancy on our cluster, right? And how do we create a long-term data storage which are resilient and which will sort of thrive in sort of a very high-scale environment, right? So this is where uh, we come up with a plan of, okay, we'll again use completely open source components to build this data pipeline out, right? So we needed data syncs, right? So we needed a sync for per tenant, sync for uh, metrics and traces. So which means we would deploy a particular Prometheus instance uh, or a deployment if you want uh, uh, in the form of Prometheus custom resource uh, for in the tenant's namespace. And same goes for Jaeger, we'll just deploy a Jaeger custom resource in streaming mode and uh, with Kafka so that you know uh, data isn't lost. Right, because we do not want to lose data from uh, our trace uh, config if uh, you know one of our let's say deployment goes down, right? And we planned on integrating the long-term storages, which were already supported by both uh, Prometheus and uh, Jaeger at that point of time, and is still supported. Which is we want plan to use Cortex uh, with Cassandra backend for uh, metrics data, and we were again use Cassandra. Uh, back in with Jaeger. So this sort of arrived at a very nice solution where all of this data for the metrics and traces were coming to a single Cassandra data sync, right? And uh, we basically had tenant for tenant 01, we had tenant 01 trace key space and for uh, the same tenant, we had tenant 01 metrics key space. And each of the tenant data was isolated in their own key spaces. 
and we could basically scale it out very, very fast, right? So this plan sort of worked. Uh, what we needed to build this out was a couple of existing, you know, open source Kubernetes operators. We chose Prometheus operator, Yeager operator, Kafka operator for the Kafka topic we were create, creating per tenant and uh, deployment of the Cassandra itself. Now, this is where we got stuck a little bit because we there were multiple uh, offerings of how to do Cassandra on Kubernetes. There is Kila, which is a very popular project, but it's not truly Cassandra, it's Cassandra compatible. Uh, it uh, adheres to the APIs, but it's not purely the same implementation. So we initially started Scala. I was pretty excited about using Scala for this uh, purpose because we had an operator. That means we could easily create one custom resource for per tenant and namespace. We didn't have to sort of have a central thing there. But this plan sort of did not work out for us. Scala's uh, current methodology still has certain scalability things to desire, and it did not work for us. So we fell back to using a central Cassandra cluster with Bitnami Cassandra. Right, and we of course had to deploy Cortex. Now, Cortex itself is a pretty big architecture, sort of to deploy and scale. But uh, given this talk uh, covers a lot of other things, I'm not going to you know go into them a lot. Uh, but there are a lot of documentation out there on what Cortex is. I think like again, Berlin is what I call. I was discussing with our organizer just before the uh, you know we started. Is that Berlin is probably the observability capital of uh, you know the uh, world right now with all the maintainers sort of there in Red Hat and in other organizations. Uh, and uh, the, you folks are familiar with uh, uh, how Cortex and other things are there. So I'm not going into that. So what we needed to do was basically uh, create, use these components and build a multi-tenant isolated uh, sort of architecture where uh, our uh, multiple tenants data can in no way be consumed uh, by another tenant. The data access had to be very, very uh, controlled, right? And to sort of uh, do that, we again followed uh, standard practices. We keep the uh, data consumer, which is our OTIL character. We created one OTIL uh, collector per tenant namespace and uh, one Prometheus here, one Jagger custom resource also per namespace and one Kafka topic per namespace. And we sort of secured this boundary with network policies, with RBAC, since we had multiple Prometheuses running, we did not rely on a cluster role, but each Prometheus and each Jaeger had their own role and role binding. So instead of trusting a single service account uh, token or a single role, uh, each had their own service account trusting their within namespace single uh, RBAC implementation, right? And uh, we also use network policies to ensure that uh, uh, calls could only be made on certain ports within the namespace and no way can my Prometheus go, go out and scrape another tenant's namespace, right? And this we did through both network policies and also using proper level-based uh, scraping, right? So, and additionally, securing the deployments themselves with port security policies, ensuring you know resource quotas are correct, pretty standard practices, nothing fancy. Uh, and then finally, what happens is the data comes in an open OTIL collector, goes through Prometheus and Jaeger, finally goes to Cortex. Cortex dumps the data in the metrics key space, and Jaeger dumps the data in the traces key space. And finally, we have the central data sync across all our tenants, two key spaces per tenant, where we were getting all this data. And we could finally build sort of a query layer on top, which is going to be, of course, our proprietary uh, query layer. But our main core pipeline of getting uh, VVV data, if you want to call it in you know, big data terms, which is variety, volume, and uh, uh, I guess velocity, right? So we could consume uh, data in both variety, in all you know, variety, volume, and velocity, uh, and sort of have a very stable pipeline using these particular components, dump it to a single data sync, which is queryable using standard SDKs and we could build an application on top of. So uh, this sort of, uh, uh, this slide sort of sums up what uh, I had gone through uh, in my previous slide, sort of sums up the whole architecture and what is happening. And uh, uh, if you can see, uh, this is from combination of my previous slides, which is, okay, we had the load generator application uh, and we are, if you follow the colored lines, you'll be able to identify how the trace data is flowing and how the metric data is flowing. So the blue lines are sort of uh, trace data. So if you see, there are three sources representing our clients, which is the 
open sensor generator, uh, Jaeger emitter and Zipkin emitter. All of this goes through the hotel client, hotel agent, and then finally hotel collector. Uh, and we route this through the Jaeger exporter, uh, you know, uh, to a Jaeger instance, which is running in streaming mode, uh, uses Kafka topic for, you know, uh, resiliency and dumps it to Cassandra in a uh, large distributed storage format uh, so that we have data in long-term storage. Uh, Prometheus uh, metrics it also comes through the Prometheus receiver, goes out through Prometheus exporter, finally comes to be dumped in the Prometheus custom resource, which remote writes to Cortex and Cortex finally uses again Cassandra as the main uh, backend storage. So we have both metrics and trace data in a single. So this is two pillars of, uh, two out of three pillars of observability inside a single application, probably visualizable through the API layer and dashboarding in sort of a single combined view. Uh, when we were building this, I think the last week when uh, during my engagement with my signals.io, uh, the log integration was also uh, done to open telemetry, but unfortunately I haven't had the chance to look into that, but uh, you could build it out in the same way, right? You could take the data, uh, logging data also in the same way and finally dump it into a central data store. And finally, we have a proper pipeline setup on top of which you can build a unified dashboard with all three pillars of observability there, and you could build correlations on top, right? So the problem of multiple dashboards and you know frantically, uh, uh, you know, just looking around to figure out what is going on. You're looking at trace data. You're seeing whether spikes are happening on the metrics dashboard, uh, and you know you're look, uh, digging through logs on Kibana and figuring out you know which particular application is misbehaving. Is it a particular pod or not? All of that uh, sort of frantic looking sort of becomes much more peaceful. And now we have consolidated data in one single space. Cool. So uh, this is sort of the last slide. I have a small demo prepared where I demonstrate uh, whatever I talked about. This is again a pre recorded demo. And uh, as Stefan had said earlier in the talk, <laughs> that we all <laughs> learned, I think, during uh, 2020, that uh, doing live demos uh, during online talks are probably not the best idea. So I have a recorded demo. But before I go to that, I will ask you to probably scan this particular QR code and this will take you to the link that's mentioned above where the base code is dumped. It doesn't have the complete multi-tenant implementation, but it has enough code to basically get someone started in open telemetry in, on Kubernetes directly. It contains all the templated manifests that someone could deploy, deploy and get started if they're interested. Uh, so with that, I will switch out to the demo and try and keep it short and see if we can cover that. So apologies uh, at the very beginning, the video is sort of choppy. I was using an inherent uh, you know, Linux tool to sort of record this instead of using a sort of proprietary recorder. And uh, turned, the video turned out to be choppy. We lost pixels on the way. Cool, so let's uh, wait there. Um, so this is what I have, you know, we have a config gamble. We, uh, we are just looking at the load generator. We have a deployment, we have a config map, we have a Go, Golang application and we have a service to expose this, right? And finally, we're looking to the actual Golang application, right? And uh, all of this, by the way, is available in the repo that I mentioned earlier. So you folks can go ahead and look and uh, uh, see how the whole thing is organized. So what you can see from this particular Golang code is that we are sort of writing how to generate trace, which traces to generate, and certain metrics also, right? If you can see uh, that uh, we are, I don't have a pointer in this, so uh, not sure how I'm going to see this, but uh, let's see. Cool, so if you can see the just the previous frame, right? So uh, under the CTX tag new context background, right? This is where we are creating the trace. And on top of that, we are creating the open census metrics. So the name description measure and aggregation and tag keys, the multiple maps that you see within the view. This part uh, from line number around six to 35, that is the open census metrics that are being created. And from around line number 41 to 50 downwards is how we sort of generate the trace for this particular small application. And this is not exactly how you, one would write in actual production application, but this was just like a small thing to, you know, uh, generate fake traces and fake metrics from a single small application, 
right? So yeah, again, repeating like line number six to line number 35 is metrics and then 37, uh, or sorry, 41 downwards is how I'm generating the trace from uh, open census using open census SDK. And I have no idea why am I traversing the code backwards from down to top, very unusual. So anyway, so if you can see that uh, we are actually configuring the hotel agent endpoint in this particular application and we are configuring uh, uh, it so that we can send both trace and uh, matrix data to, to this particular endpoint using the open census SDK. Cool. Now we come to the uh, rest of the deployment. As you can see that we have uh, the Golang application there already. We are just mounting it inside a container and uh, using a Goran command to run it. We have Prometheus Avalanche, uh, which generates uh, uh, metrics and traces. I use small numbers for this demo because I did not want my deployments to inadvertently crash due to high stress. But uh, the whole setup does hold up once scaled uh, in the correct ways. Right. So here I have only metric count as one, one single metric with 50 series, which are being, uh, you know, exposed out of this particular load generator. And then we have, of course, synthetic load generator, once running with Jaeger and once running with uh, Zipkin. Right. And in both cases, if you see, we configure the hotel agent uh, receiver port uh, as the target from our load generator application. In case of Jaeger, we target the uh, 14268 port, which is one of the Jaeger ports. And same goes for Zipkin. We uh, expose, uh, we send the data to the Zipkin port, which is 9411 in the Zipkin format. So the receiver itself acts or masquerades as if it's a Zipkin instance. So the application is completely unaware whether it's portal agent or it's an actual Zipkin instance it's sending to. To the application, it's the same because the APIs are exactly the same. Cool, and of course, we just expose the load generator with uh, a service. And yeah, this is which was uh, a bit part of my uh, slides, which is how the uh, opens uh, hotel agent is sort of configured. As you can see, we had three data sources, open sensors, Zipkin and Jaeger. We have receivers for that. We have the Prometheus with scrape, uh, uh, scraping uh, config uh, ex and the uh, exporters, which is again towards our targets, right? Again, for this demo, I was using open sensors, but the ideal way to do is use OTLP, which is the internal format. Uh, try and not use open sensors, just use, uh, you know, if you're fanning in, fan into OTLP and fan out from OTLP. Do not use open census. I, this was at the beginning when I was, I was still discovering the ecosystem. So, you know, the, the video has that. Cool. And this is finally the uh, open telemetry as in deployment, which I think you can find. So let's actually move on, right? Because uh, just browsing through YAMLs in a demo is not going to be interesting. So what we have is the hotel agent deployed. And later on, this is the logging part, which I was talking about since Logging exporter basically lets me verify that uh, all the data dumps, uh, all the data that from load generator are actually coming into the hotel agent. And I can verify that, yes, all the metrics and traces, all of that is actually finally coming through, right? And it, it helps when you are initially setting stuff up. And once it's done, you can, uh, you know, just forget about it. Now, same goes for open telemetry collector. I am not going through the config again because, uh, you know, the demo sort of uh, the uh, PPT sort of uh, cover that. But as I was talking about the tail sampling, so this demo has that tail sampling enabled and we will have a small look into that. Cool. So this is our final result, right? Where we actually dump our data into the data sync. We expose the service, we open up Jaeger service. Now this is our final Jaeger where our exporters from the open telemetry collector are sending data to, right? And this is technically in our platform cluster where we have received customer data already. And as you can see, all the data that we had received from, let's say, open sensors and the other uh, different uh, you know, emitters, all of the data is together in a single sort of 
uh, format in a single place and we can browse each service separately right so we create we can have the data here in our first Yiga, uh, uh, data sync right and this is all happening to, and this is the visualization of the DAG visualization uh, uh, through uh, Yiga. So yeah, so in this demo, all the data is flowing through, you know, what we discussed, the open telemetry agent on the clients cluster and the open telemetry, uh, uh, open telemetry collector on uh, the uh, production cluster, which is a platform cluster. Cool, we'll also see how the Prometheus data is coming in. Cool. So uh, we had talked about the Prometheus metric was generated uh, using the slow gender call Avalanche. And we can see that Avalanche has uh, started uh, generating the metrics which are being consumed at the uh, platform end uh, in a different cluster altogether. And uh, we can see all the metrics coming in through Open Telemetry Collector. And I think with that, the sort of small demo ends. There is not much to it. So this demo does not have the whole Cortex and uh, multi-tenant setup because uh, we I did not have time to get the whole thing done uh, for today, uh, very short notice. But uh, the idea is that the concepts that we discussed in the slide uh, are going to hold. And uh, this is the backbone of sort of the metric backbone of the product that we built. And uh, yeah, with that, I think uh, my talk sort of over and I'm open for questions.